Part of what I love so much about the Zelda series is the ambiguity of its lore. While most games take place in the Kingdom of Hyrule, more often than not the land looks completely different with each appearance, full of different characters, enemies, items and dungeons. But the developers always make sure to leave little threads, little connections between things, the Goron symbol in the Arbiter's Grounds or a reference to Twilight Princess in Breath of the Wild. Some of these little details spark crazy fan theories, which are some of my favourite things about the Zelda series. And some of these theories are so solid, so well grounded, that it can't have been anything but intentional from the developers. But for every piece of the puzzle that is the Zelda series that fits, ten more just don't make sense at all. So today I'm going to run through five of my personal favourite unexplained things across the Zelda series. Mysteries that as of now are completely unsolved. The Zonai Ruins Breath of the Wild has its fair share of mysteries. It's set in a world a century after the cataclysmic resurfacing of Calamity Ganon caused an apocalypse. The few inhabitants of Hyrule that survive cower in primitive settlements, trying to carve a life for themselves in the remains of the kingdom. While we have a good idea of what happened a century before the game, the events that created the majority of the ruins that litter Hyrule, there are some far older ruins, predating the Calamity, that are one of the game's most intriguing mysteries. The Zonai Ruins are one of the most interesting details in Breath of the Wild's world. They appear mainly in the Farron Province, where statues representing snakes and owls stand sentinel in the forest, marking pathways. There's an abundance of ruins near the Spring of Courage, which seem to be the ancient remains of a city, now inhabited by Moblins and Lizalfos, their original architects long dead. Whoever built this stonework was clearly incredibly skilled, as countless intricate designs can be seen across the broken walls and statues, the most impressive of which is a giant dragon's head. This dragon, or serpent, appears constantly throughout the designs of the Zonai. It's thought that these ancient people worship this dragon, likely the dragon Farosh, who appears throughout the Farron province. Though in addition to the serpentine stonework, which represents courage, there are owls which represent wisdom, and boars which represent power, a primitive depiction of the Triforce. The creators of the Zonai Ruins also created the Barbarian Armour Set, which states it was originally used by a warlike tribe from the Farron region. So that explains it, right? They were simply an ancient people who lived in the Farron Woods, worshipping a water dragon. Not quite. The Zonai are actually a whole lot more mysterious than it seems. Their ruins don't only appear in the Farron region, but across the entirety of Hyrule, meaning at some point this ancient civilization could have spanned the entire country. They built the great labyrinths found in remote areas of Hyrule, such as far out in the ocean or in barren wastelands, gigantic unexplained mazes. And what's even more confusing is their connection to the Sheikah. These Zonai labyrinths are tests, with a Sheikah shrine at their centre. The Spring of Courage, too, seems to be at the heart of the Zonai ruins in the Farron province. And the eternally dark Typhlo ruins show the remains of what seems to have been a large Zonai city, again with a shrine at its core. Whoever these ancient people were, their civilization not only covered the entire kingdom, but was also closely related to the mysterious Sheikah. Whoever this ancient tribe was, they were clearly more than the barbarians their armour suggests. They were incredibly skilled, pious and powerful. But their story, who they truly were and what happened to them, remains a mystery. Ganondorf's Armour Moving on to a mystery from Twilight Princess. Ganondorf's armour in the HD remake was, like the rest of the game, polished and upscaled for HD. For the most part it's exactly the same as in the original game, great black plate armour with ornate gold trimmings. But there's a little detail on his chest plate that's completely unexplained. Here we can see a depiction of Link, wielding a sword and shield and clad in his iconic tunic and hat, fighting some sort of giant bird. The bird is unlike anything we've seen in the series, the closest being the Helmorok King from The Wind Waker, a fight which took place in an entirely different timeline. 
Which bird is Link fighting here, and why does Ganondorf have an image of the hero, his eternal adversary, on his armor? It's such a bizarre detail for which there's no clear explanation. Low Rule's Rift Low Rule is a parallel world to Hyrule, only appearing once in A Link Between Worlds on the 3DS. It's an exact polar opposite to the main kingdom, even its Triforce before it was destroyed was an inverted version of Hyrule's sacred triangles. Because Lowrule is an entirely separate dimension to Hyrule, travelling between the two is nearly impossible, except for rifts which are small cracks in space-time that allow for paintings to slip through. The vast majority of these rifts, which appear across Hyrule and Lowrule, were created by Yuga, the Lowrulean sorcerer and counterpart to Hyrule's Ganondorf. But Yuga didn't create every rift. Originally, he was completely unaware of Hyrule's existence. But in Lowrule's sacred realm, Yuga found a rift, a tear through which he could sense the existence of another kingdom. It was because of this discovery that his plan to seize Hyrule's Triforce was hatched, leading to the kidnapping of the sages and the resurrection of Ganon. But this rift's origins are completely unknown. Yuga didn't create it, so why a crack in Lowrule's sacred realm that led to Hyrule existed is a mystery. Perhaps it was a result of the Lowrulians destroying their Triforce, or perhaps someone planned to connect the two worlds long before Yuga. Whatever the true explanation is, I don't think we'll ever get a clear answer. The Impossible Song The Song of Storms is one of the most iconic Zelda themes. Debuting in Ocarina of Time, it has the power to summon a thunderstorm. Even the brightest day will turn sour with heavy rainfall and webs of lightning if Link plays the Song of Storms. It's learned in Kakariko Village in the future from the Man in the Windmill, where it's required to drain the well in the past. But it's not as simple as this. Where the song actually comes from is a paradox, and its true origin is still unknown. So, in the future, Link can talk to the man in the windmill to find that he's going insane. A song is stuck in his head that caused his windmill to go crazy, a song that was apparently taught to him seven years ago by a kid with an ocarina. He can teach Link this song, which is the Song of Storms. Then, if Link travels back in time seven years, he can find the man in the windmill, trying to come up with a song that, like the windmill, goes around and around. Link can then teach him the Song of Storms, which causes the windmill to turn incredibly quickly and drain the well. So the mystery is, where did the song actually come from? It's learned from the man in the windmill in the future, who claims that he learned it seven years ago from a kid with an ocarina. Then when you travel back in time, it turns out that you're the kid with the ocarina, and you can teach him the song. So there's no actual origin for this song. Somehow during this little time loop, the song appeared. Majora's Mask offers a possible solution. In Termina, the Song of Storms was apparently composed by Flat and Sharp, the composer brothers who served the Ikana royal family. But whether or not Termina is actually real is a bit unclear, and even if it is, it doesn't explain how the song became stuck in this time loop. I personally would prefer it if this was never explained. The paradox perfectly suits the Song of Storms. Like the windmill, the Song of Storms goes around and around this loop in time, taught and learned, learned and taught, with no true beginning. Snow Peak Mansion Snow Peak is a colossal mountain range in the northwest of Hyrule. The extreme cold of the region makes it a treacherous place, where only the hardiest travellers would be able to survive. Deep in this frozen tundra lies an abandoned mansion, known as the Snow Peak Ruins. The Snow Peak Ruins are the remains of a palace, great stone walls and columns standing vigil, stark against the freezing wasteland around it. It sits alone, steadfast on a small outcrop of the mountain, accessible only by a thin bridge. Although the building is a mansion, it's just as much a fortress. While opulent and carved from the finest stone, its walls are thick and unyielding, and watchtowers reach high above them with clear views of the surrounding mountains. The building is built in such a way that its high walls protect an inner courtyard, along with an armory and multiple cannons. Cannons can't be found anywhere else in Hyrule, save for the city in the skies. 
Within the stone walls of the mansion lie a kitchen, multiple storerooms, a library, and notably a chapel, with multiple pews all facing a room at the end. A mysterious coat of arms decorate the house, an emblem featured on the shields, doors, and walls of the building, featuring two rapier-like swords crossed over a coloured shield. This coat of arms is unlike anything we've seen before in the series, a design that likely belonged to the mysterious residents of the house. Though the roofs of the castle are caved in in places, like great open wounds in the corpse of the citadel, the sheer scale and power can still be felt. Whatever this place was, it was owned by powerful people, people with a strong need to defend themselves. People with enemies, enemies dangerous enough to warrant the construction of a fortress in the most remote location in the kingdom, with watchtowers, artillery, and thick stone walls. Yet, despite the incredible military might of the house, and the beautiful, well-crafted and comfortable living areas, there's no sign of the mansion's original inhabitants. Despite the huge amount of wealth required to construct and maintain this fortress, it lies empty in the cold. During Twilight Princess, the mansion serves as one of the game's dungeons, inhabited by a yeti couple and containing one of the shards of the Mirror of Twilight. An ancient citadel high up in the bitter tundra of Snowpeak, slowly being reclaimed by the wintry elements it was designed to defend against. We never explicitly learn who owned the mansion or why it was built. We don't know why it's heavily stocked with weapons and armour, and even artillery, yet still features a comfortable master bedroom and living areas. Who owned Snowpeak Mansion, and why was it abandoned? The mystery of Snowpeak Mansion is so interesting because there are clues to its previous owners, but they provide more questions than they do answers. The strange crest of the crossed swords that appears throughout the mansion is also found in Hyrule Castle, in the tower where Link finds Princess Zelda, meaning that it's very possible that the mansion was owned by the Hyrulean royal family, or at least someone closely connected to them. The palace-like interior supports this, and the military defences could have provided protection for its regal inhabitants. But then, if the mansion was owned by the royal family, why is it full of armour far too large for any human to wear? Great suits of armour, just like the armour worn by the dungeon's mini-boss, Darkhammer, decorate the walls, and Darkhammer himself appears to be some sort of Lizalfos. Why would a royal palace be full of Lizalfos armour? Why was this mansion abandoned? The mystery of Snowpeak Mansion is one of the strangest, most interesting mysteries in the series. And unless we see a return to this fortress in a future game, it'll likely remain unexplained. Thanks for watching this video. What's your favourite unsolved Zelda mystery? Let me know in the comments. And what are your theories on anything I've covered in this video? If you like this video, please consider leaving a like or subscribing if you haven't already. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.